ಹರ್ತರಂತರಂಸರಸ್ಯಾಮ್ರಾಮಭದ್ರಾ ವೇದಸಿ ರಘುನಾಥಯ ನಥಾಯ ಸೀತಾಯ ಪತಯ ನಮಃ I bow again and again to Shri Rama, who is the remover of all misfortunes, giver of prosperity, who is the beloved of the whole universe, and salutations to the Lord Rama, who is present in all beings as Rama, Rama Bhadra, Rama Chandra, and also Lord of the Raghu, Vamsa, the husband of Sita, Om Shri Ram Jai. Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, victory and glory to Ram. Om Shri Ram, Ram, Ram Yeti, Ram Yeti, Ram Yeti, Manu Ram Yeti, Sahasra Nama, Tatulyam, Rama, Nama, Varanani. I delight in the beautiful name of Shri Ram again and again, for even once remembered this name of Rama, bestows the fruit equal to the thousand names of Lord Vishnu. So this is a continuation of our series on Ramayana, the story of Rama, a little disrupted due to foreign travel. And so it's useful just to review a few things, just to refresh our memory about where we left off. We are now at the stage of that kandam, that portion, which is called Ayodhya kandam. Ayodhya is the center, really, of the whole story, geographically. In more recent times, it has been a controversial place because of the sanctity of the place and the fact that we can identify where this place is today is evidence that this story is not just a, a story, a myth, or something of that nature, but falls into the category of Itihasa, historical account. You may wonder, but so many marvelous things are happening here, worthy of mythology. And of course, like any story, as time goes on, things get elaborated and embellished. But why are we studying this book? We're studying it for many reasons, just to remind you. Firstly, it is a historical work of great importance, just as all the other epics throughout the world have significant literature and historical significance. In ancient Greece, we have the uh, various Greek epics, the Iliad, Odyssey, and we have the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Ramayana is the older one. Let us say about 7,000 years old, according to some. Secondly, it's not just a story with historical and literature significance. It is something that will give us something. It will teach us about what is called dharma. Dharma from a root, the thing that holds everything together, knits everything together, in a certain harmony and requires us to review the various qualities within us before we review the dharmic qualities in the world. There are many people, and I've come across a few recently, who said, what a terrible disaster this world is. Well, you never studied history because the Second World War in the last century was even more devastating for the entire world. Some people speculate, are we not on the verge of a nuclear war? Another World War III. 
Well, if you speculate like that, I have no answer. Any answer will also be speculative. The fact is that the world is not designed to go smoothly in terms of human events. As long as we have a dharma that is within us, some discord that is not resolved, then the expansion of that on a political basis, national basis, will have its telling effect. So this story embraces all of these aspects, personal qualities that are necessary, personal virtues, and who is the exemplar of the most supreme and superb virtues. It is Rama, the opposite of Mara. Mara represents Adharma, discord. Ma Rama represents harmony and an attempt to make an adjustment toward harmony universally. And the theory of Avatara comes in here. Somebody especially born from the cosmic mind, a cosmic balancing power that from age to age restores this harmony. That is the theory. Valmiki is very keen to tell us, as I mentioned last time, about these virtues of Rama. He extols them wonderfully, verse after verse after verse. It is worth examining each one. So, firstly, Rama was uh, ever free from anger. Even apart from that, his physique was classic and fascinating, says Valmiki. His physique was classic and fascinating. What has that to do with virtue? If you are virtuous inside, you'll take care of every aspect of the human person. You'll also be strong. You'll also be healthy. And thought is the immediate transference of welfare or otherwise. I'd like to quote from some of the thoughts of the Holy Mother, Sharada Devi, who was the very expert on meditation, prayer, and japa. In terms of japa, she says, japa purifies the body and the mind, purifies the body. That is a thought that is of the noblest character, it is the sacred name of God, carries with it a potency that makes the physical body vibrate well. Because thought is the precursor to all the vibratory activity of every cell of the body. So we can see his virtues verging on divinity almost. His body, it says, says Valmiki, beamed with brightness and vigor. And at the same time, he was simple and free from conceit. You can see wonderful physiques modeled on the Greek model of Greek statues and so on. But you see, if other virtues are not there, if pride is there, if conceit is there, all your mental activity will be orientated on the physical. That is a mistaken identity of embodiment. And this is one of the great obstacles that we have. I have come across very recently many yoga groups. I'm about to encounter many more on my travels. And many of them will understand yoga as a physical, cultural thing. And I am very keen to take this misunderstanding and to be brutally honest about it. I start with a question. What has yoga got to do with health and wellness is my question. It's an astonishing question to many, but my own reply is very little. There was once a time when I said nothing. It had nothing to do with it. Now I've modified the answer and said, oh, very, very little. It's a very secondary importance. It is good to maintain the body as an instrument. It's good to maintain the mind as an instrument. Sanskrit description for the mind or the yogic description of the mind is Adha Karana, an internal instrument. It is instrumental to us. The body is our earth car, instrumental to us. 
So at the same time, he was simple and free from conceit, a quality of high thinking, simple living. Contentment was characteristic of him. Contentment is equal to thankfulness. We are content with this present moment. We don't want anything more. We don't want anything added to it or taken away from it. And he would not use offensive words. It means he never thought in an offensive way. He gave sweet reply to annoying interrogations. Annoying interrogations come from children. Why, why, why? Annoying inter uh, it comes from adults as well, curious people whose mind is at a level of trivia. Even so, he never got annoyed at this. He's highlighting human characteristics in us that obviously need to be identified, named, and also replaced. A trifling good turn done to him, says Valmiki, was always remembered. Even a trifling thing was always remembered. Spirit of generosity. Any amount of bad turns done to him were immediately forgotten. Immediately forgotten. Forgive and forget. You know the old saying that I often bring up, you know. Yes, Swamiji, I can forgive, but I cannot forgive, forget. It means if you cannot forget, you never forgave. Rama was respectful to the elders those people who are elderly, and we, I immediately, when I hear this, I think of many of the old age homes that have been subject of investigations of abuse to the elderly, those who are helpless. And so he delighted in dialogues with the learned and the wise. He, the incarnation, delighted in dialogues with those who were more learned and wiser. His utterances were always agreeable, pertinent and pleasing. No false statement, no purposeless babbling would ever emanate from his mouth. He was precise and irrefutable in debate, no wastage of words. Somebody brings somebody something up and a person immediately disagrees, not with any antagonistic motive behind it. Today, it's very fashionable to have various debates, the the theism versus atheism, or even Judaism versus Christianity and so on. Many, many debates can be found if you look at YouTube. But he was very precise. In other words, his thinking was logical and concentrated. And he had an unfailing memory the result of lack of concentration is a poor memory. One of the devotees many years ago said to me, oh, Swamiji, I can't remember this and that. I've got a very bad memory, accepting it as part and parcel of his natural makeup. And I said, no, you lack concentration. And he was quite offended by the statement. He said, no, no, I can concentrate. I said, all right. But you see, if you write something down, don't think that it is a weakness or failure on your part. When you write something down, it aids the memory. Why? Because there's an, ele an element of concentration involved in it. Don't be afraid to write something down. And memory is simply, we all of us have failing memories about certain things. The things that are important, significant for us, pass through a filter and get categorized, important, significant. I should remember this. And repetition is a way of doing it. When we repeat the fact of the presence of the divinity here and now, always doing it, this is called practice. It's equivalent to practice of viveka or discernment. He was ever free from anger. He would refrain from, what is anger? Anger is an immediate reaction that occurs without any thought. It's an irrational process. He would refrain from actions and utterances harmful to others. He was resourceful in problematic situations. Seeing a flow of ideas coming from 
God's resource called the unconscious mind, preparing to wait until the right solution comes, what I call bring out a 20th elephant, that if there's a problem, then there's a matching solution somewhere. And the mind is capable and designed to review and bring out solutions to problems. The wonderfully designed mechanism. But we have to think of it in this way. I am responsible for memory as well as his loss, says Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. It's as if the Lord himself is our librarian. And when we say, uh, what was his name? And look in the direction, certain direction to access our memory. The Lord, our filing officer, is busy getting out the appropriate memory and presenting it to us nicely. We don't even thank him for this. He is untiring in the discharge of his duty. We have to identify what our duty is. He's sagacious in the acquisition of wealth and spontaneous in adding to the joy of people. I learned a wonderful lesson when I was young. I thought in monastic life that the vow of poverty meant that you would never touch money whatsoever. And Ram Krishna couldn't do it. So good model to follow. My teacher gave me a book. And the book was called Think and Grow Rich <laughs> by Napoleon Hill, I think it was. Think and Grow Rich. Please study this. I was appalled. I said, this is in scripture. He said, no mind, read it. You'll get an adjustment in your thinking about wealth. Wealth is a resource. From the Hindu point of view, wealth is the embodiment of Lakshmi, abundance. It's not something that is evil. It's a resource to be accepted and utilized. But don't take it in a material way. Take it in a divine way. It's divinely dispen dispensed to us. As soon as we view all these wealth resources as part of a divine flow of grace and energy, then our abundance and wealth increases. This is what is behind worship of Lakshmi. Then he, um, untiring the discharge of duty, acquisition of wealth, and spontaneous in adding to the joy of people. What value are we unless any of every physical encounter with another person leaves the person sad or neutral or worried why don't we try to elevate them? Why don't we leave them with a, an air of joyfulness? Can we not be a beaming mechanism that leaves joy in its wake for everybody? Sloth and vagary found no place in the makeup of this prince, never lazy. He was ever alert and watchful. He was too discreet to be deluded. Some people think holiness means you're a fool. We can take advantage of you. You can be the doormat. No. In issues public as well as private, he would with ease discern between merits and demerits. The core of a man's worth was ever open to his gaze. He had a transparent vision. He wasn't a fool. He knew whom to take into confidence and from whom to keep aloof. He was discerning in his attitudes. And there was no trace, there's the key. There was no trace of selfishness, says Valmiki in Rama. He lived for others. He was beneficent to the poor. He lived for others, Swami Vivekananda said. He who lives, who lives for others lives. The rest is more dead and alive, or more dead and alive. He was beneficent to the poor. He supported the adorable custodians of culture. The distress, the distressed received remedial measures from him. He gave protection to all beings. Purity of purpose marked him for its own. He was the embodiment in short of righteousness or talma. And time was always profitably spent by him. No wastage. Every moment was a moment of opportunity to him. Truly, he was the incomparable on earth. Why is Valmiki extolling our virtues for, our, for us to have a model to follow in constructing our own virtues? 
but also because he's telling us this is the ideal ruler. This is the Yuvaraj. This is the prince who will take over as king. Very worthy person. The wisdom of a father in bringing up the son consists in doing the right thing promptly in time. And as son comes of age, he thought to be entrusted both with power and property. The youth's dormant talents are thereby drawn out. So the opportunity induces him to come out in exuberance. There's a moment in time where youth matures and we're able to, with all these virtues behind us, go on to the next stage, a fulfilling stage. And so we take up the role, all of us take up a role that is specifically designed for us. On his part, he was uh, in Dasarata, that is from Dasarata's point of view, he was getting a little older, much older actually, and he realized, I have to let go. It's a wonderful example I want, of a system that doesn't perpetuate the temptation in nations of dictators. If you look at many countries within Africa, unfortunately, there's a cultural concept that a leader is a father of the nation if he's a male. And very few females are their leaders in Africa. So a father of the nation, father of the nation, whether he's good, whether he's bad, and he, he's kept in for years and years and together. In my own country of Zimbabwe, this has been the case, where a person, even at the age of beyond 90 years of age, still lingers on. And even when his proposed successor takes over in something like a military coup, people frown on his activity and say, oh, the son, the rebellious son against the father, even if the father wasn't good. And so we come to this point where he is the Yuvaraj designate. Now we also have to see that there's a significant event in the story that soon after, if you recall, the bridal party returns to Ayodhya, going backwards now, because Ram and Sita lived in Ayodhya beautifully for some 12 years. But Oh, almost immediately after the bridal party enters Ayodhya from Mithila, there was an agreeable request that came to Dasarata. It came from his aged father-in-law, the king of Kekea. You recall that one of Dasarata's queens is Kaikei. The person who came on this commission was also the ruling pr prince uh, of Kaikea. He was the brother-in-law, Dasarata's brother-in-law. And he's also, of course, the brother of the third queen, Queen Kaikei. It's important to understand that, to see how the story starts to unfold. And the simplest request was that Bharata, who was the grandson, be sent over to Kekha, Kekha, Kekaya in order to give delight to the grandfather. And Dasarata, of course, agrees to fulfill the desire of his beloved father-in-law. So he asked Bharata. Bharata, of course, has a constant companion, his brother Shatrugna, and they go away to stay there for some time. So Bharata is absent while a, a significant part of the story starts to unfold. Having said that, we can now see and pick up also where we left off last time to see how this story unfolds, but still as part of the background, we should say that uh, whatever avatar, I assume, this is a quotation here from uh, Ram and Sita, they spent 12 years, hardships and sorrows will come, of course, as they come to all of us, but as Bhagavan himself explains, whatever avatara I assume, he says, says Vishnu, my play must go through the feelings and experiences appropriate to that incarnation. Because very often a theological debate emerges. Let's take Christianity, for example. 
for 300 years and odd after Jesus, in the second and third centuries, there was still a great debate about the nature of Jesus. If he suffered, died on the cross, how can he be the word made flesh and dwelling amongst us? And it was really only at the Council of Nicaea that uh, developed by Constantine or initiated by him, that this issue was resolved for all time. And so in Christianity, there's no doubt that Jesus is God incarnate. Well, then why does he suffer? He's not a perfect being, but this is the explanation. So who was this Prince of Ayodhya, just to remind us, who through this body and life experience suffered the sorrows of mankind? So far, we haven't seen him suffer any sorrows. And eventually, we know he's born to save the whole world. The ever presence, all pervasive being who rules the world from within and without is this incarnation. Kamban, who is a Tamil poet, he begins his version of the Ayodhya Kanda referring to this marvel of how the king of kings allowed himself to suffer the cruel machinations of a critical person in the story who was a hunchback maidservant and also of a stepmother which deprives Rama eventually of his rightful place with scepter and has him banished to the forest and beyond the sea. Now I'm preempting the story a bit, but we all know basically what happens. Anyway, as we pointed out last time, Dasarata loved all his four sons. But yet, of course, he had this specific or special affection, naturally, for Rama, as did everybody. And so, of course, Rama has deserved, uh, because of his royal qualities, all the virtues that we have mentioned, and his adherence to Dharma, he deserved the Yuvaraja position that is the king designate. And Queen Kosalya, like Aditi, the mother of the gods, Aditi is the mother of all the deities, male, female. Aditi is essentially practically nature herself, giving birth to all the deities. She was, of course, very proud of her son as Rama. Now, I mentioned that Valpiki, Valmiki has filled pages and pages and pages with Rama's virtue, and he was never satisfied with uh, by just mere extolling the virtues again and again, pages after pages after pages. So, having made that decision, let us now uh, make Rama the king designate, of course, uh, there was joy everywhere. But here's the unique thing, he wanted to do it very quickly. He consults, as I mentioned last time, everybody on this matter, as is necessary for a wise person. And they all agree, yes. But because of the hurriedness of this coronation, and a uh, lot of preparations had to be made. You can imagine a scene now where the king has embraced Rama and seats him, beside, uh, seats him immediately beside him in assembly and declares, I'm old, just to remind you, I have enjoyed my life as a man and also as a king. I discharge all my duties to my ancestors. It's a very important part of this. We have a duty to ancestors. We have a duty to other beings. We have a duty to the deprived and the poor, our fellow man. We have a duty to our parents and those who are older and wiser for us than us. We have a duty to our guru. All of these are various duties. Even feeding the ants, other beings, is a duty, is part of a normal household duty. But duty to the ancestors, you are not here independently. You are here to fulfill through XY chromosomes all the desires and, and, active, and ambitions of your ancestral line. It's not a, 
a mistake. It's not a random thing that you're born in a physical way. So his only desire now, Dasaratha, is to install on the throne of his ancestors this Brahma. But of course, because he has a dream which uh, seemed to portray difficult portents, he decides tomorrow I have to do it. And tomorrow is the auspicious time according to the arrangement of the cosmos, which we call astrology or even astronomy. It should happen. Now, of course, all this I have mentioned previously, just to refresh your memories now. So, taking leave of his father after this, Rama goes to Kausalya's apartment to give her the news and seek her blessing. But the queen had heard the news already. And so they were all busy making arrangements. And Rama reported to his mother the king's la la latest uh, command to her. Says, and she had already heard this. And then she blesses him. May you live long, be a good ruler, conquer your enemies, protect your subjects and kinsfolk. You have pleased your father and you have made me happy. And here she outlines in those days the model of a ruler, what qualities are necessary. You have to be a good ruler, wise. You have to conquer your enemies. And you have to protect your subjects and kinsfolk. You have to be pleasing to everybody, but at the same time, you have to be wise and just. Then, uh, as directed by the king, his advisor, Vashishta, he comes to Rama's place and he was welcomed at the entrance and Vashishta initiates Rama with two mantras in his pre-coronation fast. Now, this I have covered before, I'm just refreshing your memory about this. But let us see what's happening amongst all this joyous emotion and all these wonderful preparations sacred preparations and also decorations and everything that's necessary for a significant coronation. So Queen Kaike, I mentioned last week, had a woman companion. We know that Mantra, who, is, who now is infamous, is the equivalent of uh, the Christian Judas. And we also have to take this in a different way. When we dream, for example, uh, of uh, somebody who is jealous, then it probably means that we have this quality of jealousy within us and it's coming out in a personified way. And it's not necessarily obvious, but we have to be persuaded. The ideas have to be sold to us. They are done through internal dialogues. So, on the day which Dasarat summoned the assembly and decided to anoint Rama as the Yuvaraja, Mantra climbs up to the terrace of the women's apartments, and I covered this last time, and starts inserting some doubts, some difficulties. Summarized, they were like this. You're a favorite queen. But Parata, as we know, is her way. In the absence of Parata, this coronation is happening. And your own son will not be honored. Your own son will miss an opportunity to rule. And you see, not, not only that, but Rama's own mother will now be the favorite queen. You were previously the favorite queen. So all of these small strands were inserted into the psyche of the queen, Queen Kaikei. So she sees all the joys and of course she's happy as well and mantra is disturbed by the fact this fact why are you wearing this silk dress she asks what is uh, going on in the city kosalya seems to be distributing gifts to the brahmanas you're doing nothing she's a thrifty lady and she won't be doing this for for nothing she's doing this because she also secretly wants to be the favorite queen, superseding you. Why do you not know? 
she says that Ramachandra is going to be anointed. Yes, I know this. So what? Oh, foolish woman, says this maidservant. A flood of misfortune is rising to drown you and swallow you. You are betrayed and ruined. Your sun is setting. You can't see it. And Kaikeyi starts getting fearful. What is troubling you? Why are you not celebrating? But jealousy is clever, is subtle. Mantra, the embodiment of this disturbing thought. She says, destruction has actually come upon you and me and everybody else because Dasarata has decided to make Rama your Raja. And Rama is not your biological son. Of course, it's your stepson, if you will. And so like the simple woman you are, says the persuasive mantra, you've been deceived. This is not straightforward. Your husband has cheated you. He's cheated you with sweet words saying that yes, he promised. He promised that Bharata would be because the favorite queen and so on. And on the battlefield, it was this favorite queen that nursed him to health. And he promised her, I give you everything. He promised and he forgot his promise. This is what Mantra is telling her. And after tomorrow, the whole thing will be over. Rama will be have this coronation. And so like this, she kept talking and talking and talking. Can we recognize this in our own life? Yes. An internal dialogue that begins off with a seed of miscontent, dis misunderstanding. Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras describes this as verbal delusion. And this uh, verbal delusion, what is it? It is our imagination that comes up with something and then other strands of discontent feed it until it grows into a monster. So Kaikei thought that mantra, like any other personal attendant was initially, was uh, just saying it out of concern and loyalty and love and all the rest of it. But uh, anyway, this increases the whole reaction. And ultimately, she stopped, mantra stops, unable to continue in grief for Kaikei, supposed grief we have to insert. And why should Mantra have such fears is her questioning. Still not convinced, but still we can see the subtlety of conviction coming through. Even so, Rama is the embodiment of Dharma. I love her, him like my own son. Yes, but you see, he's the elder prince. He gets the kingdom. Bharata will get it one day after him. What is wrong with all of this? No, you can't be persuaded in this way because when Rama ascends the throne, all prospects of royalty for Bharata and his line are at an end. And after Rama, Rama's son will be king. It's not just Rama, his son is next in line. And after him, that, the succession will go on. The eldest son succeeds the eldest son. There's no chance for a younger brother, no matter how good a man he is. And what is the consequence for you as the queen? Once Ram is crowned, he will not leave Bharata alone. You will see him as a threat. In those days, it was so. If you look at study the various sultans in the Ottoman Empire, you see that the uh, various uh, sheikhs or the sovereigns of the Ottoman Empire will look to their own brothers, imprison them, and even kill them as threats to succession. And so in those days, you see a very real danger in normal circumstances. If you want Bharata to live, not to be killed, advise him to remain away where he is now, an exile from home. For if he returns, he's coming to a certain death. 
and it would be much safer to him, for him to be at his uncle's house. Hide his head in obscurity in some more distant land, please do it. And Kausalya also, you think that she's a sister. She's no friend of yours. She bears you a grudge. What is this grudge? Because you actually are the king's favorite and you have slighted her. And now she is sure to wreak vengeance on you because she'll be the prime queen. And you know the wrath of a rival queen is raging fire when it finds its chance. None of this is true, but this is all this imagination coming up. You may take it that if Ram is king, Bharata is as good as dead. Therefore think hard, be firm. You only have tomorrow. Decide something and stick to it. And somehow Bharata must be crowned. Rama must be banished from the kingdom. That's your only choice. Now, with all of this, the great reaction that anybody has is fear. And fear now starts and it enters into the heart of the queen. Mantra has done her job. She has won. Kakei's face was flushed. Her breath became hot. These are symptoms of disturbance of mind. And helpless, she clings to her tempter, mantra, for comfort and safety. These two are in a secret bond together, as it were. And because his first two wives had been born no children, Dasarata following the royal custom, of course, he marries Kakei, that's the story. And at that time, of course, Kaikeya's father secured uh, from Dasarata, Dasarata the promise the child of her womb should be king after him. All this has been forgotten. And so in such a promise given by a childless king, there was nothing surprising, nothing wrong, nothing unusual. At that time, his, all his queens had long been childless. And so the king takes a third wife. This is why this is done to make sure that the succession, line of succession occurs. But you see, even Kai Kei doesn't get progeny. And even then his wish for a son to be born wasn't fulfilled. So that is the background to why are there so many wives? And after the great sacrifice that we know of was performed, all the three wives bore children, all of them. And the son of the queen, um, eminent Rama, was the eldest among the four sons. He was also the great, greatest in his virtue, fully equal to the burden of the kingship. And how could Dasarata violate the royal custom and ignoring Rama's claim? How could he now fulfill his promise and anoint Bharata? And so Bharata neither him nor Kake had ever thought of or wished for the fulfillment of this old and forgotten promise, but now it's surfacing. And during all the intervening years, no word had been spoken on the, on the subject. It was all forgotten, but now it's resurfacing. And so the king thought there could be no difficulty in installing Rama. He had forgotten all of this. He didn't think it was any problem at all, but in accordance with the custom of dynasty and public expectation, he should crown Rama. So from Kaikeya's mind up to this point, there was no even thought about this. And Bharata too was noble in this question. He never thought about it either. And yet as Dasarata told Rama with the purest of minds, the purest of minds, can be changed. We have to be constantly watching for this. When fate conspires with bad counsel from others, stimulating bad counsel to ourselves, and the ultimate bad counsel is within ourselves, any one of us might have our minds corrupted. This happened to Kaikei. The deities in heaven, if you want to put it like that, had received an assurance that the sages had performed their tapas for the destruction of Ravana. What we call destiny therefore ordained. 
that Kaikeya's pure heart should be changed by Mantra's evil counsel. This brings a very important question up. Is this my own corrupted mind or is this destiny playing its part? And uh, that remains a question mark, but Valmiki says, not only is this the corrupted mind and we're all open to it, but it is also there to fulfill a certain destiny. It seemed to be part of the play because without that, Rama cannot go into exile. Without Rama going into exile, Sita cannot be abducted. If Sita is not abducted, Rama cannot go to war. If Rama cannot go to war, Ram, then Ravana cannot be destroyed. So the whole thing weaves into some questions. I don't think we're able to fully answer these questions satisfactorily, except to say that the moment of weakness that we have could be advantageous overall, and we should not review it in the past and regret we have to accept it as it is. But we have to resolve not to be, because it could have happened in a different way, of course. It could be that Rama might have been inspired by some injustice. It might be that Rama might have been hunting and Sita by his side and been abducted. It could have happened in a different way. Anyway, let's call it a certain destiny, necessary in the overall plot of the play. Anyway, fearing that delay might bring some unpredictable obstacles, we know Dasaratha had ordered the coronation to be done without waiting for Bharata's return to the capital. And you can see as part of the intrinsic plot of, the, of this drama that he sees that there's some, uh, some difficulty, some obstacle, some unfortunate circumstance portended. And that is why there's an urgency for this coronation. But it also increases the suspicion of Queen Kaike. So, Antara is saying, think, why is this haste? Why does he want to do it tomorrow? Why does it, you see, there's something difficult about this, something unusual about it. You have to be highly suspicious about why he wants to do this all of a sudden. Why does your husband rush through the ceremony when your son is absent? Isn't it to cheat him of his right is the last straw? Isn't it, isn't his motive plain? The king is pretending to be enamored of you and love you, but this is only his hypocritical shrewdness. Well, that was the last straw. Okay, thought of our mantra's advice. The thought was not very well balanced. And she had a good feeling and good culture besides a keen intellect. She wasn't, she was a queen after all, with good breeding. But she had very little knowledge of the world actually. So her suspicions rose. And she was also very obstinate. obstinate and easily deceived at the end. She didn't really have the power to foresee the disastrous actions that would take place. And so Kakei, who herself previously had looked on Rama as her own son, was enmeshed in this plot and all the arguments. And finally, indeed, I'm afraid. Tell me, what should I do? Am I to be a servant to Kosalya? Will Bharata never be crowned? Ah, you're quite right, was her final conclusion. And Rama must be sent to the forest. But how shall we get all this done? Do you know a clever way? And then she gets this advice and this understanding of the way to do, to force her will. So, it's indeed strange. Is it for me to tell you how this could be brought about, says Mantra? Have you really forgotten, or are you just pretending? 
If you want me to stay, to say it, I shall do so, if you're prepared to listen. So not only was there this great, great imagination that brought out what Patanjali calls verbal delusion, but also finds a devious way of handling it. We all know what it is, of course. How to stop this coronation quickly? Well, we have to look to households now. In a household, it's very often a scenario where one of the two, let's say the wife says, leave me alone and goes off to the bedroom. Don't follow me. And then looks, why isn't he following me? And so this was the technique. You remember how your husband does that at a long ago fought against Sambara in the south, Mantra reminds her. And you were with him, were you not? Your husband went, didn't he? To help Indra, Sambara of a giant, he was too powerful for Indra. And he sought your help or Dasarata's help, your husband's help. And didn't Dasarata get wounded in the battle? Didn't he lose consciousness? And then you drove his chariot. You yourself drove his chariot skillfully out of the battle and gently removed the arrows from his body and revived him and saved his life. Haven't you forgotten all of this? And what did he tell you then? He told you in thankfulness and gratitude, ask me for two gifts, two boons, two wishes. I shall give you anything you want. And you answered, I shall ask for my boons later. I can't think of anything now. I shall ask you for them later. I don't want anything. Then he promised, ah, oh, you will have your two gifts whenever you want them. You told me all that this long ago yourself says Mantra. You may have forgotten it, but I haven't. Now the time has arrived to get him to redeem his promise. Demand that he should crown Bharata instead of Ram. This will be the first of, of the two gifts. And for the second gift, ask that Rama be sent to the forest for 14 years. 14 years, why 14 years? Seven and seven, 14 years. As we know, this whole universe is balanced with configurations of seven and nine. Don't be frightened. Don't fear to ask. Do you think it's sinful to demand this? Do what I tell you. It's only if Rama is sent into the forest that his hold on the people will relax and disappear in course of time and your son's position will be secure. You love Rama, of course, at the end of the day, so you don't want to have him dispatched uh, in any other way except exile. You can't do away with him physically. You can't condemn him to death and you'll be extremely unpopular. Ram is very popular. So go now, lie down in the sulking room. They had a sulking room in this great Paris com palace complex. And to get some idea of it, we can look at some of the old Rajasthani pa palaces. Let us say, you know, uh, overlooking the Taj Mahal those kinds of things. And we can see that there are different chambers for different purposes. So there's one called a sulking room. You go away there and everybody knows you're displeased and you're grieving over some issue. You want to lie down there, throw away all your fine dress and your jewels, wear an old sari and stretch yourself on the floor in distress. And then when the king enters the room, don't speak to him. Is a technique. What is wrong? Nothing. Means everything. Do not even look at him. I'm sure he cannot endure your sorrow. You will then have your way with him. And the king will try to get around you. Don't yield. He will offer you many alternatives. Accept none of them. Insist on these two gifts, these two boons, and be firm. So bound by his promise, the king will finally come round. I know how passionately he loves you. He would give up his very life for your sake. To please, you would, you, he would jump into the fire. So do what I tell you, don't be afraid. And unless Ram is sent to the forest, your wish will not be fulfilled. Rama must be sent away, ask that as your second boon. Only then the position will get, for Bharata will be real and lasting. Remember this, mind you, 
don't weaken in this resolve. And listening to this exhortation, seemingly coming from outside, but we all have a choice about evaluating these things. Kakei's face shone with hope. Oh, I see, okay. What a brain you have, Mantra. You've given me the answer, exclaimed. Uh, she's exclaiming. And you have been, uh, you are the salvation of me. And so she was very happy at the solution, not understanding the dire consequences of this for herself and for others. Mantra repeats again and again, the drama must be sent to the forest. The, there's a play on words in the story, by the way, because mantra and man, mantra, very similar terms with the same kinds of roots coming from manasa mind. It is our own mind that is doing this and creating havoc. And it happens, as I mentioned, as an internal conversation with ourselves. The conversation continues. Don't delay what needs to be done. Do it at once. It's no good strengthening the tank bund after the waters have flown out. Remember what I've told you. Everything depends on your firmness. Victory is yours if you don't yield. And Kaikei assures the tempter mantra of her firmness and forthwith she enters into the sulking room. She takes off her jewels as was recommended, scatters them all on the floor, changes her clothes, stretches herself on the floor, then assuming, assuming a broken voice, she said, Mantra, you will yourself carry the news to my, fa my father, Kaikaya. You yourself will tell him one of two things, either that Bharata is to be crowned or that Kaikaya is dead. Tell my own family this, she's saying. Kaikaya in her anger now, believes that Dasara had really been treacherous to her. Jealousy, desire, anger, these are the three components that she has. Even then, stretched on the ground, divesting herself of all the ornaments and putting on a face of grief and anger, she looked inexpressibly beautiful. So great was her beauty. And the sinful thought had found lodgment in her mind and her whole nature was transformed. The fear that she would lead a slave's life and that even Bharata's life was in peril had got hold of her. And for the first time in her life, she cast aside the sense of shame and sin and hardened her heart. For the first time in her life. And heaving heavy sighs, perspiring and with eyes closed, Kaikei, who's still beautiful like a Naga goddess, unbraids her hair and lays on the floor with disheveled tresses sprawling like a bird shot down by a hunter. See, well, make his graphic descriptions of all this. The flowers and shining jewels which once adorned her person, they scattered in the dark room like stars in the midnight sky. But very often, if we don't read this elaborate description and these conversations, we really miss the beauty and poetry without reading the original Sanskrit, just in the translation of what Valmiki has to say to us. And uh, because we could easily dismiss the story and say, well, Kaikei was tempted. She, the mantra came, had a conversation. We can make a summary of it, but we miss the graphic scenic uh, descriptions that Valmiki has given us. Next week, we'll bring this up and go on and see how the king handles this difficult situation as this drama unfolds for us. So we leave it there until next week. And as I said earlier, in reading this story, we have to see the different layers of this. As you see, I'm reading the story. But as I'm reading the story, I'm seeing what the practical applications of this is for us. Because that's part of the value of the story, not just a story. We can see how it could be portrayed and has been portrayed on screens everywhere throughout the world. And how these stories can appear in cartoon forms for children. But we can see also the great value, firstly, of the virtues that are necessary for our own lives 
and what can easily shake these things. And one thing that easily shakes us is imagination, falsely cultivated. And it is this imagination that eats at us like a cancer. So we have to always be watchful for this and see how this drama unfolds. We leave it there until next week. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thanks. Thank you, Swami. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Swami. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami Ji. Oh.